Is it too late to quit? No, no, you're fine. You can primp all you want. I mean, you're live, but you can do it. I said, is it oh, too is late it too, to quit? Is it too late to quit? No, it's, it's yes. It's about it to quit. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Doing it this. Is, it is too late to quit. Yeah. <laughs> we got a little less than a minute. All right, Heather, I trust you. Well, that should honestly scare both of us. I know. <laughs> Okay, here we go. I think. I'm trying to get Facebook Live. It's doing what it did previously. And I want to make sure that it's okay. We're we're live. Let me make sure I'm muted, <laughs> or at least the live. screen is muted. Okay, we should be muted. We should not hear double me. Okay, everybody out there, hello. This is Heather Registers of Bendon from the Roberts Library. Um, the Bobby L. Roberts Library for Arkansas History and Art. Uh, the Roberts Library is located in downtown Little Rock across Rock Street from the main library and houses the galleries at Library Square, the Butler Center for Arkansas Studies, and the Encyclopedia of Arkansas. I want to thank everyone for joining us. Let us know um, if you're out there by saying hi in the chat on Zoom. Tell us where you're watching from. Um, we'd like to know, we normally get people from Arkansas and from Little Rock, but we'd love to know um, where everybody's from. Same goes for you over on Facebook Live. It seems to be streaming okay, so let us know if you're out there as well. So before we get started with today's program, I want to do um, a few Central Arkansas Library System related announcements. Most of our libraries are now open on specific days and hours for in-branch services like computer usage and, so, and shelf browsing. Please go to CALS, that's C-A-L-S dot org, to find out what days and times your branch is open. Curbside is still an option at most all branches in the system. Again, check with, um, check at CALS org for more details and specifics on that. The Roberts Library Research Room and the galleries at Library Square are open on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays from 9 to 11 a.m. and from 1 to 5 p.m. The early time slot is set aside exclusively for high-risk populations. Go to robertslibrary.org for specific instructions on how to enter the building, the public health and safety, the public health safety measures we're requiring and for details on accessing the manuscript collections. The library system has suspended in in person public programs until the end of August, but of course we're doing lots of virtual programs. This is the fourth month that we've done legacies and lunch um, virtually. But we also have story times, cooking classes, craft activities, and fun podcasts. You can find most of these programs archived at Cal's YouTube channel. So go to YouTube, search for Central Arkansas Library System, and you can subscribe to the channel to get notifications um, when the latest videos are posted. And please also follow the Central Arkansas Library System and Roberts Library on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram so you can fill your feed with interesting, fun, and educational content. One of the things we are doing at Roberts Library is collecting stories, photos, and art related to the COVID-19 experiences of Arkansans. We did a similar collecting initiative last year during the Arkansas River flood. So go to robertslibrary.org for more information or to submit your photographs and stories. Um, we wanna hear from you. 
your story is important to Arkansas history. Okay, so now it's time for our program. As you can see, or hopefully you can see, um, there is Rhonda Stewart. Um, she is one of the employees at the Roberts Library. So a quick program note before we get started. This program is being um, live streamed to Facebook and, and afterwards we will also upload it to the YouTube channel in the next couple of days. So you'll be able to watch it over and over again in perpetuity um, and get all the information that all the wisdom and information that you need from Rhonda. Um, a few instructions about the webinar. Please type your questions for the speaker in the chat and use the Q&A for tech questions um, or issues that you're having with Zoom. I will try my best to help you while Rhonda's talking. Um, and I will also be monitoring the comments on Facebook Live. At least I think we will. Last time that didn't work so well. So fingers crossed, hopefully it will work. Okay, so now to today's program. From the Civil War to Central High School, the legacy of Richard Toombs. The United States experienced many changes between April 1861 and April 1961. And placing an individual family within this, top, within this context brings it to life. Richard Toombs served in the United States color troops during the Civil War. And nearly a century later, his grandsons, Willie and Preston Toombs, were part of the legal quest to end segregation in Little Rock's public schools. Cal's local history and genealogy expert, Ron, expert Rhonda Stewart explores the events of the Civil War and of the Central High Crisis, documenting a century of history through the eyes of the Toombs family of Little Rock, Arkansas, and giving a personal glimpse into one family's journey and impact on the American story. So I want everybody to give a big virtual welcome to Rhonda Stewart, and I'm gonna turn it over to you. <laughs> okay, we're gonna try this. Uh, welcome, thank you for coming in uh, and listening to me speak about my family, which is always one of my favorite topics. Personally, I happen to believe I was born into the best family in the whole wide world. And uh, they've proven to me that I am one of the best because they continue to grow and show their love that we were taught when we were young people. Um, I'm not a Central High graduate. I am a Park View graduate, class of 1979, shout out. Um, but we get to teach Central students about their history is what I always say. So no, no problem. We just, uh, we're all in the mix. I did have several members of my family go through Central. I uh, grew up hearing my grandfather say, or my aunts and uncles say, daddy said we can go to Central if we wanted to, but we didn't want to. So that kind of got me wondering, well, how is this possible? And after my grandmother passed, I overheard her youngest child, her youngest daughter, say all that stuff she said about our family wasn't true. So let me tell you about the importance of oral history. I grew up at the foot of my grandmother. I lived in my grandparents' house the first six years of my life. So I absorbed many conversations. I listened and I learned a lot just by being in that house. And uh, when my grandmother passed, I got offended at my aunt and I went to the public library and I started researching my family. And the oral history led me to the documents I needed to prove my connection to our Civil War ancestor. I'd always heard we had one. Nobody could remember his name. Nobody could remember many of the stories, but I found a documentation to prove it. And then my, I called him my Uncle Preston. He was actually, I guess, a cousin. But my Uncle Preston asked me around that same time, well, how do I fit in? How do we all connect? And so I knew there was a lot of us. Today, I think we have more than 300 relatives in the Pulaski County area and quite a few more around the nation. But um, I set out on a quest to find out how we all connected and who belonged to who. So that led to me um, using this family as uh, the basis for my thesis, for my master's degree. From the Civil War to Central High School, to the Toons family in Arkansas. And I start off by basically figuring out what was happening when. So I started with the Civil War in 1861. April 12th, 1861 was the first shot to the Civil War. April 12th, 1961 was me. So I had to have a connection to the Civil War in my mind. 
but I didn't know what it was until I started digging through documents at the public library. And I started with city directories and went backwards. Then I found the census records and Linda McDowell, who was the genealogist at the time, actually showed me quite a few records that I could browse on microfilm or some books and uh, really lit the fire in me to find more information. And then that same aunt that said my grandmother didn't know what she was talking about or didn't tell the truth was the one that told me about an advertisement in a newspaper for an assistant genealogist at the public library. And I didn't believe her, I wasn't gonna apply, but she kept pushing. And here I am 15 years later doing the same work that I just started out as a hobby to prove her wrong about. It. So I'm glad to uh, introduce you to my family. So 1861 to 1961, that 100 years, a lot happened in my family history. So I wanted to share a little bit of that with you. Our Civil War ancestor, Richard Toombs, fought for the United States Colored Troops. This is one of the first documents I found proving that he was in the military and that led me to other documentations. I do know that he served most of the time that he served in or around the city of Memphis, Tennessee. So that's a big city. And when I was in college, undergraduate at uh, Arkansas State University, I used to go to Memphis quite often with several friends. I'd ride over, go for a day trip or something, come back. But I never really felt right in Memphis. There was always something off about Memphis for me. I liked driving through Memphis. I didn't really want to hang out in Memphis. And as I discovered more about my family, I understand that may have been an ancestral planting in my seed that uh, Memphis wasn't always good to us. It is today. I have several relatives over there right now that are living great lives. One of them, shout out to my favorite cousin, one of my favorite cousins, because they're all my favorite, Val Bernie Toombs Worlds, who is a school teacher in the Memphis area. But for me, Memphis did not hold that appeal. And then when I found out about Richard Toombs and his service and his discharge in the city of Memphis after the Civil War, and some of the things that led to him moving the family from Tennessee to Arkansas, I understood in my own head why maybe I didn't like Memphis. First of all, Richard was uh, let out of the army at, uh, in 1865, he was discharged. He stayed in the Memphis area, found him a wife. Um, 1866, there was a race riot in the city of Memphis. He survived that. 1868, there was a flu outbreak in the city of Memphis. He survived that and then brought the family to Sagahatchee, Arkansas. So again, that brought me quite a few questions. I kept digging and I found a couple of other documents. This is a declaration for invalid pension, proof that that ancestor served in the Civil War and he drew a pension. I noticed on this document, I know it's not real clear for you to see, but the name Richard Toombs is misspelled, it's spelled T-O-O-M-S. And then I noticed there's a little X in between the first and last name. So Richard did not write that name, but he signed an X that was his mark. So technically he couldn't write, someone wrote his name for him and that could be why it was misspelled, which caused a lot of headache for me trying to prove that this was indeed the right person. But I found documentation where they used that name and a couple other spellings and it was definitely the same Richard that I was looking for. The document on the right side from the National Archives shows me that three of his youngest children out of his eight received a pension on his behalf after he died. And that was Turley Toombs, Carrie Toombs, they were twins, and then Clarence Toombs was his youngest child. And Clarence is the, is the father of Preston Toombs, who was in the Little Rock area with my grandfather, Willie Toombs. So those two grandsons, we're in Little Rock, uh, but they came from the Sagahatchee area. Willie's father is Edward Noxy Toombs. Nobody knew the name Edward until I discovered it on some documentation because we only knew him as Noxy. That was the story we heard, Noxy Toombs, Noxy Toombs. But his name was actually Edward Noxy Toombs. And so with the three youngest kids getting this pension, uh, that's a pretty nice income for a family up on the mountain over there. And uh, led to some interesting conversations about family history. Anyway, proof that Richard, even though he was technically not educated, was smart enough to make sure his children were provided for upon his death. 
then I found enough information to apply for my Civil War Ancestry certificate. And I applied through the name of my youngest uncle, Charles Knox Toombs, the youngest of 15 siblings. Um, 14 lived to be adults, but he's the youngest. And he's living in the Houston, Texas area right now. This is from the Arkansas Genealogical Society. I had to verify the proof that I had, that I was connected to these people and they sent out the certificate. So from the Civil War, I can document the biological collection, connection to Charles Knox Tombs. And Charles Knox Tombs has sons that served in the military, so the, uh, it's still going on. We have mili many military service members in my family. I was not shocked at the connection to Richard because there were so many in my family that we, uh, that I grew up knowing that were in the military, like uh, my uncle Calvin Toombs who lived in Colorado the last years of his life as a child living with my grandparents out in the backyard playing. Every time we saw an airplane go over, we would yell, hey, Uncle Calvin, because we didn't know what kind of airplane he flew or was in. We just knew he flew airplanes or was in airplanes a lot. So we always waved at airplanes, yelling at Uncle Calvin. And uh, that's one of my fondest memories as a child in the house of my grandparents, because they started that wave at your Uncle Cav Calvin because he's up there in the sky, and that's what we did. The blessings of family. The paternal side of the family that I'm looking at, and I must say, um, this is my story, my family, and with every family, there are many different directions you can go. My focus right now is on Richard, his sons, and of course, all the way down to me. So Richard Toombs is our Civil War veteran. He was married to a woman named Molly Brown. And I think Molly was a nickname, but I haven't proven it yet. But they were together. Um, she uh, lived in the, uh, right there at that break between Tennessee and Mississippi. So I don't know if she was really on the Mississippi side or the Tennessee side, but she was right in that area. So they got together and had some children. Elwood Noxy Toons was their firstborn child. And his records say he was born in Virginia. and. Uh, that kind of threw me off, but most of the records say he was born in Virginia, but I know people traveled during that time period and they may have been in Virginia when he was born. He grew up and married a woman named Elizabeth Kelly. Elizabeth Kelly came out of Aberdeen, Mississippi. And uh, together they had at least five children that I know of. Um, three of them I know lived to be an adult. The other two I haven't quite tracked yet. I'm still working on it because genealogy is never ending. There's always somebody else to research. Clarence Toons was the youngest son of Richard. And Clarence did a whole lot. He was the youngest son, so I'm sure those siblings took very good care of him. He was always traveling with one or another, living with one brother or the other brother. I found him in Lono County. Of course, they came out of Conway County. And then he and his brother Turley moved to Oklahoma. Clarence was in Oklahoma at the time of the Tulsa race riots. As a matter of fact, the next 40 years after that event, he lived in the neighboring county. So he was in that area. He survived whatever happened then, but either way he knew of what happened because he was a young man at the time. And so those stories may have even reached my grandfather, which I'm sure they did because the practice in my family is family members kept up with each other, no matter where they were, we knew what was going on. Clarence had a child with Willie Blanche Vample. That's the mother of Preston. And so those are the tombs that you see in the Little Rock area come from Edward and Clarence. Willie Toombs is the middle son of Noxie. He had an older brother, William Henry. I never knew his first name was William until, of course, I found a documentation because we always just called him Uncle Henry. He died in the 1940s, but it was like he was still living as I grew up because the conversations about Uncle Henry were so vivid. Uh, one of my aunts actually remembers visiting him when he was in the hospital and how he gave them candy from his hospital room. So I had all of those stories, so I had to find the documentation. He also had a sister named Claire and one name I know we called Aunt May. I remember Aunt May because she was quite a character. I love the characters in my family. There's some uh, very uh, unique people, uh, great personalities. And uh, like I say, I'm from the best family in the world. But Willie Toombs married Adina Butler. That was his first wife. They married 
at a very young age, uh, early 20s, late teens, early 20s. And uh, they divorced not long after that. Because in 1927, the last lynching in Little Rock, Arkansas officially was that of John Carter. My grandfather would have been 22 years old when that event took place. Imagine the protesters we have out in the streets of, uh, around the world right now and the age of those protesters and the emotions of those protesters. So I imagine my uncle was in that same kind of vibe, same feeling. Uh, he may have understood the Tulsa race riot more than I would today because he was closer to the event. Plus he had family members in the area. So he may have had firsthand knowledge of some of the things that were said or that were done in that area. So he's got all of that in him. And then this event happens in Little Rock. And so I'm sure he was going off as they say, uh, just knowing some of the personalities of the male figures in my family, I imagine he was very voiceful in his opinion about what was happening at that time. So Miss Adina did what most rational people would do. She took her children and went back to her mother's house <laughs> and uh, they soon divorced. He then married, by the way, she had two children with him. And then he married uh, Myrtle Mae Pfeiffer who came out of uh, Clark County, Arkansas. And she had eight children with him. And uh, one died in, as an infant and she died shortly after the birth of that eighth child. Then he married Lily Stewart. Lily Stewart brought two children into the family and they had two together. So we're all mixed together as one family because we're family by blood and we're family by love. And so Willie Toombs and his three wives, I did not know the difference until I was an adult, which set of children came from which wife, because we were all just family. And then when I found out, I was like, well, I thought Miss Adina was just Mom Lilith's best friend, because she was at all the family events. I knew her. I got kicked out of school, public schools in the third grade, and had to go to Catholic school. And when I got to uh, St. Bartholomew, one day my grandmother, before I got to school, before school started, my grandmother took me by Miss Adina's house and showed her how close she lived, showed me how close she lived to St. Bartholomew and told me if I ever got in trouble or if something was happening, run to Miss Adina. So I knew Miss Adina as a family member and as someone I could trust. And sure enough, as a fourth grader walking down the street to the public library at the time that was behind uh, Soul Brothers Record Shop on 16th and High Street was the name then, it's Martin Luther King now, Miss Adina would be sitting on, his, on her porch. I thought she was waiting for me all the time. And she'd always wave at me and I always wave back, letting her know I was okay. So I had a personal relationship with Miss Adina. Plus I knew all her kids, they were just my cousins. I didn't know they were her kids. I just thought she was a family member until later in life when I realized, oh, the relationships. Now Preston was married to a lady named Betty Jane Williams. And I knew her from family gatherings but I also knew that she worked as a seamstress, seamstress downtown. And as a nine-year-old, I was allowed to venture out on my own and go downtown and hang out and look around. I always went to uh, the YWCA at the time. And then I would swing by and uh, check in with Miss Betty uh, Toombs. When I thought I was checking in, but actually she was checking up on me. I didn't realize just the vastness of my family and their connections. But wherever I went as a child, there was somebody that knew my family and somebody reporting to my family that I was okay or they saw me. I remember once on the bus, I jumped on the bus to go to the YWCA and uh, my grandmother's sister, Aura, was on that bus. And Aura was one of those characters in the family that I really love. And Aura stood up in the middle of that bus and told everybody on that bus, that's my GD niece. And if anybody mess with her, you got to deal with me. So I felt like the strongest person in Little Rock. I had the most protection of anybody in Little Rock because I had all these folks that saying they will fight for me. And they did. And they taught me to be a fighter. I am the sum of my ancestors. These are just a few of the pictures. This is uh, Miss Adina and her youngest daughter, Willene, Myrtle May, Mama Lily, Papa. And then on the bottom, you see Preston, See Pawpaw's sons carrying his casket to his grave. A photo of Pawpaw in his suit and tie, because he was a railroad man, but he was always clean and whatever he wore. And I like that picture of the suit and tie, but I wish I had a picture of him in his railroad hat. 
because he was a walking advertisement for my grandmother's uh, laundry business. Nobody could crease a, uh, a hat like my grandmother could. And that railroad hat was her advertisement. People came all over from all over to get her services because of the clothes he wore, I believe. I thought it was her advertisement. And then of course, a uh, picture of uh, some of my uncles at that same funeral. One of my great uncles and one of my favorite uncles, Willie and Uncle Johnny and the other picture. But these are some of the people and some of the characters that I grew up with. And as a young child, I think that was the best thing that could happen to me because I had all of these opinions, all of these personalities, and I can pick and choose who I wanted to be like. I've always been a gatherer of information. I've always gathered information. Uh, I think my grandmother started me doing that just to keep check on who was doing what in the family. But it was a good thing because as I gathered information, she explained to me who these people were and how they fit in to me. And I was able to make a decision based off of some of their actions, whether or not I want to be like that person or be like that person. One of the things I definitely got from my family uh, was uh, I'm fluent in profanity because I had an aunt that was very fluent in profanity and uh, she knew how to use it and she used it well. And I learned to use it also, but it got me in trouble. That's the reason I got kicked out of third grade because uh, I was uh, in interaction with a white teacher for the first time in my life. And we had had conversations in my family about how to interact with white teachers because we knew this was coming. And I would get kicked, stay, get to uh, stay after school a lot because I would get in trouble because I'd always help somebody else do their work because I always finished mine first or I would just entertain the class by making everybody laugh. And so when I had to stay after school, that wasn't a problem, except on the days I had to take my little sister to the beauty shop because mama didn't play that. Well, this particular teacher, by the way, the principal was Curtis Sykes. So I'm living with history my whole life and not knowing it. And uh, the teacher said, black people don't go to the beauty shop. And that aunt, that taught me profanity just came out of me. And I said, B, you don't know. And by the time I got to the word no, she had slapped me down on the floor. So I went to get my older brother, my protector. He came back with a uh, toy gun that he had customized with electrical tape and actually made her apologize to me for slapping me. She had a nervous breakdown and left in an ambulance. I'm sorry about that. Changed the trajectory of my life. That's what sent me to Catholic school, but I was felt bad because my siblings also had to leave school. But again, the strength of my family got me through that because I didn't quite understand what, what was going on, why we couldn't go back to school. I love school. I always liked to learn, but I was thankful that uh, the nuns allowed us to come to St. Bartholomew. Plus I had relatives over there, made some new friends over there, great memories, and learned quite a bit about the history of the Catholic church in Little Rock. Now, Willie Toombs and Miss Aden, the children they have, Elizabeth, Velma, and Willie was not biologically Willie Toombs, but she was still his. She was still looked at as a aunt to me, a cousin to some, but I knew her name, I knew her, I knew some of the people, and just some of the uh, basic information I found. When you start doing research, you find all kinds of names. So uh, Miss Adina was the daughter at the time of Hester and Jesse Purifor. I think Jesse may have been her stepfather. I'm not sure because I haven't verified all of this through my other relatives. This is just my story of what I found. And her siblings were Mary Butler and Melinda Butler. And so when you start doing your research, you will find all these other names. And you can research each name. You can find out what happened because technically you are re related to all of these different families. They came together to create you. None of us are in this world alone. We all attach to somebody else, whether you like them or not, they are your family. And you don't have to like them to research them. But I like mine, so I keep researching, I keep digging. And Willie Toombs married Myrtle Mae Pfeiffer. That's the only picture I've ever seen of her. I got a cousin that looks exactly like her. He looks exactly like her to me. But she was born in Clark County, Arkansas, the granddaughter of Charlie and Melinda Pfeiffer the daughter of Chess Pfeiffer and Ham Brown. So again, we have other names. She lived with her Aunt Maggie Vance in Little Rock area. I knew Maggie's daughter, Lucille. And again, I didn't know how she was connected to the family. I just knew she was part of the family. 
And then my grandfather was always checking on her. My grandmother was always making sure she was okay. She lived alone. And then in uh, the later parts of her life, she ended up in the same nursing home with my grandmother's sister, Aunt Ruth. So again, we had those family dynamics right there together and we check on both at the same time. The children that Myrtle May gave birth to were Terry, Catherine, and we pronounced it Catherine, not Catherine, Remus, Romus, who died at birth, Francis, Willie Lee, or Willie, as we said, Virgin, Shirley Ray, and Calvin. I noticed just in these two wives, Papa had two daughters named after his mother. Mary Elizabeth is named after Elizabeth Kelly. Virgin is named after Elizabeth Kelly, Kelly, because Betty is an abbreviation or a nickname for Elizabeth in a lot of records. And some of the records I found with Noxie and Elizabeth on them had Betty as her name, not Elizabeth. So again, he named two of his daughters after his mother. Mama Lily, born in Morton, Arkansas, granddaughter of John and Mariah Holyfield Rowland, daughter of Charlie and Nita Rowland Stewart, siblings are Ruth Rowland Burnett, Johnny Cunningham, Charlie Air Pistol Stewart, Effie Stewart Johnson, or Stewart Hodges. Lots of stories about these people. Uh, I know for a fact that uh, Nita Rowland sold hot tamales on the streets of Morton, Arkansas, because Aunt Ruth and Aura and Mom Lila all taught me that they had to say a little rhyme when they were selling hot tamales. And it was one for a nickel, two for a dime. I would sell them cheaper, but they're none of mine because Mama taught them money management and they had to come back with the right amount of money for the selling of her hot tamales. But she also taught them to be business people. Mom Lily's business for the most time of my growing up was as a laundress and a cook. Mostly she worked out of the house. And uh, again, her advertisement was my grandfather walking around. And so she had some of the highest name members of society in Little Rock at the time that were uh, using her laundry business out of the house. And with all the grandkids she had in that house, that clothesline in the backyard never never ever got abused. The children didn't go near it. The dirt didn't get kicked up on the laundry and the whitest whites came off that line and she cleaned and folded and, and washed all that stuff. And uh, we did good not to mess up her laundry. These are the children of Willie Toombs. My Uncle Turley, and many people know him because he had a tax business here in the Little Rock area on 14th and Woodrow. The building still stands. But Uncle Turley, big uncle, I realized just how much he knew about what everybody was doing because he would roll up on folks, especially where well, I would see him roll up on me. What y'all doing over here? Who you with? You know, or just check it in. But he was one of those uncles that we definitely admired. I admired. Uncle Remus was the one that moved to California. He has a daughter named Rhonda Toombs. So I think she's named after me because she's younger. So we had a Rhonda Toombs and a Rhonda Stewart in the family. I was happy about that. And he, of course, all my uncles are my favorites, but Remus was one of the more flamboyant characters in the family. Always dressed nice, always smelled good, always funny. I love when he came home. His brothers didn't because he always took a hat or a jacket or something from him, but I think they were all right with it after he left, but they said they didn't like it. I liked it. But I guess what you're supposed to do to your siblings. Then my Uncle Willie in the blue suit, my Uncle Calvin sitting at the table, and then the youngest boy, Uncle Charles. The females, nine girls, Mary Elizabeth, Velma, Catherine, Juanita. Frances is in the purple and white t-shirt. That's actually the first family reunion that she organized after my grandfather died. So she set the standard. Uh, we still try to continue that uh, practice today, not as often, but it happens. My mother, Louise, in the bottom left corner, my Aunt Bet Jean, who lives in the Dallas area right now. My Aunt Shirley Ray, that lives in Sherwood, and Queen Esther Toombs, the baby of the bunch. Of these nine, uh, 14 children, only three survived. The 15th one, uh, as I said earlier, Romus did not live to be an adult. He died in infancy. But I knew all of these people. And again, the information that I gathered from them pushed me to do what I do. Uh, made it easy, just a, a fluid situation for me to move into the genealogy world just simply at look, simply by looking at my family and, and what they had going on. What was really interesting to me is that Willie, Shirley Ray, and Louise 
seem to work the same job a lot. There were at least three instances where they worked on the same job, same location, uh, beginning with economy drug. I'm like either they're good workers or they're good at getting their family members hired. But either way, they were friendly enough with each other, loved each other enough that they could work together, live together, hang out together, and uh, it was no big deal. That was one of my experiences. And I'm like, they had to get it from their parents because it was passed on. And it's my belief that most of the good that we do comes from our parents. The other stuff is what we choose to do. But we usually pass on the best of what we got from our parents. Some of my favorite pictures, and I got cousins I know that will be upset with me because I didn't put their picture in or I didn't uh, get the right picture of them. But these are some of my favorite pictures. The three at the bottom, the three girls at Central High School, Debran, Galen, and uh, Regina, I like those pictures because of the time period that we took and because they are at Central. Um, again, Central High School was a vital role in my family history. Not only did my aunts and uncles participate because of my grandfather and my uncle Preston in the Avery versus Cooper case, which started the, the uh, legal basis for the Central High Crisis, but my uncle Henry, my grandfather's brother, actually was one of the concrete finishers on that building. He worked at that building as they were building it. So again, that family connection to the building is there and cannot be denied. I just recently had three young men graduate from Central High School that all connect to Richard Toombs, my relative, our relative. Uh, there's a uh, Lamont Robinson II, Donovan Tucker, and I'm trying to get the right one. I don't know if it's Adrian or Jordan Pfeiffer, the oldest one, but he played basketball, great outstanding student at Central. But those three young men just graduated from Central in this COVID-19 class of 2020, and they all connect to the history of the building, and they all connect to Richard Toombs, our Civil War ancestor. So again, when you do your family history, you'll realize your string, that line that connects you goes farther back than what you thought and what's coming in front of you because we still have relatives that will be attending the schools open this fall at Central High School and those that will be in other places, of course, around the city, but we come from the same route. So we have that same drive and determination to do what we need to do to excel. Of course, some other uh, photos, uh, some of the in-laws that were not in-laws once they married into the family even if the marriage didn't work out, they stayed members of the family because that's how we are. Family is family. Again, your family by love or your family by blood. And if you're lucky, your family by both. And that's what we have. That's what I have. And just some of the images. And these are few. I've been collecting pictures of my family since I can remember. And I never knew that they would come in handy at this point in my life and definitely in my career. But because of them, I did achieve a master's degree based off of my research into them. Again, some other of my family members, if you can't tell, we like to party. We will go off with each other, whether it's one or two of us or whether it's a big group, but we're always getting together. We always honor our ancestors and we're always looking for ways to encourage the next generation. And that next generation has done some great things. We got some folks out there that are, uh, they have worked at the White House during the Clinton administration. They worked at the Pentagon for many decades. They worked uh, federal government jobs. It's nothing new. That's always been in the family since Richard Toombs worked in the Civil War. So that was a federal job. So that, can, that tradition has continued to this day. We still have family members working for the federal government. I once worked as a park ranger at the Central High National Historic Site. So again, and I was a member of the uh, Civilian Conservation Corps. So I'm like, okay, federal jobs are in the family. I just carried on the tradition. So with that. Thank you. My family, the Tombs family, is uh, what I've been discussing. So if there are any questions or if you want to know <laughs> which tombs I'm related to, I will let you know. Every tombs in Pulaski County, Arkansas, I am connected to. My grandfather once told me I was connected to every tombs, black or white, but I have not proven the white 
family of tombs connection, but I do know every area of uh, Little Rock or in Arkansas, the families tend to be in the same area. The family names seem to be very similar, if not duplicate. So I believe my grandfather, I just haven't proven it. The research takes time. Great, thank you so much, Rhonda. Um, that was, as you mentioned at the end, this was all, you know, you wrote your master's thesis on this um, and, and it's an important story. Um, talk a little bit, if you will, about the challenges of doing African-American genealogy, because I mean, it, it is challenging, um, especially when you're dealing, you know, when you're trying to go back pre-Civil War. Right. Okay. Uh, first thing I have to say is ignore everybody that says you can't find documentation. That's a lie. You cannot walk this earth and not leave some kind of record of yourself somewhere. The basic records you want to look for are the census records, marriage records, death records. Uh, the church records are pretty good too. And there's some birth records out there. But before 1914, do not expect to find a birth certificate. Didn't exist. Didn't happen. But there are other records, other ways to uh, document the birth of that child. 1870 is the first census that shows blacks and whites, no matter who they are, anywhere in the United States. So from 1860 forward, you should be able to find your family. Before, I'm sorry, 1870. Before 1870, you have to get a little bit more local. You have to go dig through some courthouse records sometimes, apply to uh, National Archives Records Administration for some records they may have, but there is a record out there somewhere on your relative. For instance, my grandmother said that her grandmother, Mariah, rode a white horse. I'm like, yeah, because in school I was taught women didn't own property in the 1800s. And of course, it's like, okay, that didn't happen. But I found a document, an agricultural schedule where she paid taxes on a white horse. Well, I knew the horse was white from family history, but she paid taxes on a horse. It was hers, it was not her husband's. So forget about what you've been taught and look for the evidence of what's actually there. Yeah, it's um, it's important to to really scour every resource possible. Um, for everybody out there on Zoom and Facebook, we do Rhonda, not we, Rhonda does two um, monthly, right now, two monthly genealogy sessions, classes, um, they're the first, no, the second Monday of the month. And then there's another one. It's usually the second Thursday of the month, but it's not going to be that in July. I think it's going to be on a Tuesday. Those are both on our website. You can sign up for them. It's set up as a Zoom meeting right now because we don't have any, um, we can't have any person, any in-person contact in big groups. So you, uh, Rhonda will be able to see you, you'll be able to see Rhonda, and she'll be able to answer some of your questions and help direct your research. Also, we're open now on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, so from 9 until 11 and 1 until 5, you can come in and do some research um, and have some questions answered. Um, we're all working kind of a different schedule. Rhonda may not be there when you come, um, but she's likely to be there, so that's, those are some resources that we offer here at the library. Okay, let's get to some, um, let's get to some questions. Candace Owens asked, um, if you will share all the research you, resources you use to recall your story. If I would share all the resources uh -huh. I use. That's a book. Uh, I'm sorry. That's a, that's a book you're right. You know, you're going to write oh. a book, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, well, the, my thesis, yes, is available through ProQuest now, I believe. Uh, I didn't have it printed out. Uh, I'm thinking of expanding on it because it's just a small picture of my family. But yeah, uh, my cousin Vita, who's deceased now, always asks, and still, I think in my head, asks me, when are you going to write the book, Rhonda? Well, I'm trying to get there. I'm trying to get there. And Mary, Mary Evans, wants to know where... Sagahatchee, Arkansas is? Sagahatchee, Arkansas. Sagahatchee? Yeah, it's in Conway County. If you know where Morton is, it's on the opposite side of the freeway from Morton, Arkansas. Uh, it's a very beautiful place. It's a mountain up there. Uh, I've been to one of the cemeteries up there with some of my ancestors. Uh, Rita Galloway did a book on the area. 
it's many other families. Uh, we have a copy of that book here in the library also. But yes, yeah, it's, it's a nice little place. It's an Indian name, of course, but Arkansas is also an Indian name. Uh, Downriver people is what it means. So when you do your research, understand uh, the full magnitude of who you may discover in your family. My DNA um, says there's Native American ancestry, but I, I haven't quite proven which ancestry it was. Okay, so um, we also have a comment from Hafiza Majid, and I really hope I'm pronouncing their name right because they come to every single one of these. They're, they're in Atlanta, Georgia. And she, first of all, she knew Mr. Sykes. All right. Um, and says he was one of her mentors and she learned a lot of Arkansas history from him. And then she also said that as a teenager, she lived on 14th Street and they lived down the street from Turley Toombs tax office. Yeah, yeah. And when, when, it's, when all this is over with, all this COVID stuff, she's going to, um, she's gonna come to the library um, and meet you, so. Okay. So, I'm sure she knows yeah. many of my relatives then. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you used to talk about, when we were at Central High, you used to talk about um, Jones Street. Right. Is um, that where your grandmother when was? I, when I was born in 1961, my family lived at 1111 Jones Street. 1111 Jones. It's an empty lot now. It's literally two blocks from Central High School. And so as Central was integrating, I would ask people, or well, people would ask me, did your family live in the neighborhood? I said, that depends on your description of the neighborhood. Because we were within a two block area, but most people don't describe that two blocks away as part of the Central High neighborhood. Central High neighborhood usually starts around 12th Street and goes down to 16th. So we were just on the boundaries. But I remember uh, my Uncle Charlie telling me a story about how they climbed the trees to watch the football games uh, in the stadium. And so, and then of course, Dunbar played their football games in that stadium also. And most of my relatives did go through Dunbar. So um, we have a question about signing up for your genealogy sessions. You can go to robertslibrary.org. The, the classes are called Finding Family Facts and you can register for them. They'll, there'll be a link um, and you register for the Zoom um, webinar meeting. It's really a meeting, not a webinar. Um, but, but yeah, you'll be able to sign up for those. The first one, I got to look at a calendar. The first one will be on the 13th at 3.30. And then I think the second one, didn't we decide on July 21st at 10 o'clock? I think so. That's so. right. That's a Tuesday. I think so. Yeah. But go to, go to robertslibrary.org. That really tells you where um, the right dates and the right times. Don't trust me. Um, so I think this is your cousin, maybe, T.I. Davis. Maybe not. I don't know where I got that from. Um, well, I claim there, everybody, so. <laughs> were, um, were there, was there anything about your history that you found that changed your view of history or your history in doing your research? I understood my grandfather a lot better when I realized the events that happened during his lifetime. When I knew him, of course, he was an older man sitting back on the patio uh, which I love to sit out there on the patio with him. Uh, but I didn't realize he was maybe as uh, militant as he may have been in his youth because he was just chill when I knew him, mm -hmm. unless something was going on. Uh, but I understood his love for his family because no matter what was going on, he brought his children together all the time. Uh, there was never an event that he did not have his children at his house. I never saw the man go to a church, never saw him drive a car, but he got where he needed to go and he was spiritual in nature. And so I understood more about his love and who he was after learning some of the details of uh, what happened during his lifetime. So Crystal Taylor, who's the granddaughter of Betty Taylor, would yeah. like to know if it's possible to get this particular side slideshow. She would like to show it to her siblings. Well, will the slideshow and the whole 
the whole presentation will be on YouTube um, in the next couple of days. And anybody who participates in this will get a link, the link to YouTube emailed to them once it goes up. So by the way, Crystal is my little cousin, even though she's an adult. And she is the granddaughter of uh, Marion Taylor, who was married to Bedjean Toombs Taylor. Marion Taylor is the first black state trooper in the state of Arkansas. So again, oh. family history is all around me. And, uh, <laughs> I mean, she is one of those grandchildren, yeah. And she's yeah. A also, I believe she's the one that's a teacher in Memphis also. So I got a couple of teachers over in the Memphis area that are family members. Well, and I think one thing is that you and I talk about a lot or we try to impress on people is the importance of recording all of this, getting it down in some form or fashion, whether it be writing it down or um, you know, having a file of your research, because you you don't necessarily have to have done anything, you know, what you can submit would, a photograph to a county historical yeah. journal to document your family's place in that county. Uh, one of the things I also meant to, meant to mention, Heather, was uh, before you can get to the library or let's say, uh, for instance, now when it's hard to get into the building, you can start at home. A lot of times the best history is documented in your home. Uh, it's that junk grandmama used to keep that all those papers that nobody wanted, knew why she kept them. Go through them because there may be some details. Uh, it could be an obituary in there. It could be a uh, uh, poll tax receipt or anything that will lead you to more history of your family. So go through family archives first. And Acadia wants to know, um, she's curious if there were other events or errors in Arkansas history that were particularly significant for the Tube family. For example, what was happening in Sagahatchee, I'm gonna say it wrong again, um, that attracted the tombs to Arkansas? Well, a lot of those soldiers in the Memphis area that survived that race riot of 1866 and the flu outbreak of 1868 made their way to that area of Arkansas. Um, the United States was expanding. People were moving around. Um, my grandmother used to say Arkansas was the best place you could live if you were Black living in the South. And I didn't understand what she meant by that. And what she meant was the rules and regulations in Arkansas were similar to other Southern states, but the, they were not carried out in the same way. Arkansas had more free Blacks than many other states around us during the time of slavery. There were over 600 free people of color living within the state of Arkansas uh, before the Civil War. So your ancestry may not include slavery. You cannot claim slavery until you prove slavery. And though I suspect there may have been slavery, especially with a name like Tombs, I have not proven that slavery yet because I don't know much about Richard's immediate family. Um, I suspect just based off of the number of children that are had by each generation that he was from a larger family, but I have not proven it yet. Okay, so this segues, I think, really well into, okay, tell us how many relatives you've got in around this area. Yeah, there's over 300 members of my immediate family in the Pulaski County area that I've documented. Uh, we're that, we're uh, the eighth generation actually has been born in the city of Little Rock. We've been in Little Rock since 1895. We've been in the state of Arkansas on the tomb side since 18. 69, 18, well, actually, they show up on the 1880 census. So in 1870, they're still in the Memphis area. By 1880, they're in Arkansas. Well, and also talk a little bit about family reunions, because, you know, growing up, I, I remember distinctly two family reunions, one on each side of my family. So it's not so, you know, it's not really, white people don't do it that much. Yeah. I, mean, I know that they do, but my white family didn't. So well, talk about family reunions in the black community. It's a gathering steam, but it's a way to pass on that oral history. And it's a way of uh, letting the family know that you love them. Uh, with me, the family reunions were not an organized thing before my grandfather died. But after he passed, he was that glue that everybody knew could draw the family because you just did what Papa said. 
-hmm. But after he passed and people started spreading out, one of the ways to bring them back together was with a family reunion. Um, and again, we, we carry on that tradition even now. It's not as organized or as regulated as some people would like it to be, but I'm still waiting on the next generation to take it up and do their part because sometimes the younger generations will complain about, well, y'all don't never get together. I don't know my family. Well, part of it is after you become an adult, it's up to you to decide who you want to go around. And we've had events and some young people didn't attend, but they will complain and that's okay. That's what young people do. However, before you turn 18, your parents most likely introduce you to your family, whether you like them or not, they took you around the family. And so when you start going around family, you learn who they are and you learn which ones you like, which ones you don't, and it's okay. But you also learn how strong you can be because no matter what I did growing up, I knew I had a family that supported me, that backed me up, that would tell me when I was wrong, but also told me when I was right. Uh, it's just no getting around being around that family. Today, we look at funerals and in the age of COVID, you can't even do a funeral like we used to do. But the funerals, the family reunions were two occasions when we knew the majority of family members would come out. As a matter of fact, I remember several people, community people or older family members that were, would say when we had a funeral, these young people really come out for this funeral. And, and yes, because we show our love for that individual and it's our last time to acknowledge that, yes, I'm part of this family and we're gonna walk this walk together and uh, do what we have to do to honor this person that has gone on. Um, so the reunions are important. Whether you get together in small groups or large groups doesn't matter. What matters is that you get together, you share the family history. I share my family history because it's not just mine. I understand it's my vision of what my family is but the story does not belong to me. It belongs to everyone that descends from Richard Toombs. Like I know for a fact, there's a group of family members in the Dallas, Texas area that came from a different sibling other than Noxy. There's a group out in California that came from a different sibling other than Noxy. There's a group in Minneapolis, Minnesota that came from a different sibling other than Noxy. Kansas City, Missouri has a large group they came from Sagahatchee, Mark, Arkansas, but they are not direct line from Noxie. Noxie is one of eight children, and that's the line I have followed here because I descend from Noxie. So somebody um, in in the chat wants to know um, if it says, was he originally from Memphis before he was a soldier? I'm assuming we're talking that's about- That's what I haven't proven yet, because Richard Toons is a fairly common name. Uh, he may have had a nickname, nicknames run deep in the South. I haven't proven who his people were. I haven't even verified his correct year of birth. I just know he was a soldier. What the military says is, not, is 1835 is when he was born, but I've seen other records that say he was born 15 years later. So was he a teenage soldier or was he a, a boy soldier? I don't know. I do know he was served in the military and that he drew a pension. So. I would go on the military record that he was born around 1835. And uh, most records say he was born in Tennessee, but he may have been born on the Eastern side of the state and not in the Memphis area. So in and searching Memphis and, and do more research. In searching the name Tombs, I mean, T-O-O-M-B-S. Yeah. You can only imagine the versions of that you see. I mean, I could, you know, don't do a phonetic spelling of it on the computer because you're going to get Thompson's, Thomas, Tombs, Tombs, Tools, all kinds of stuff. But uh, it's painstaking, but you can find it. Um, even though the word is mangled a lot, you can, you can find one of the things when you're doing your research, the reason why you want to look for family groups, like if they had siblings or you know who the parents are, is because it gives you insight into the misspelling sometimes because these people a lot of times were not spelling their names to the people writing it down. They were, the people writing it down were listening and writing down what they heard. For instance, Myrtle May, what confused me about her is I couldn't find her as a child. I knew her story, but I couldn't find her. Whereas a seven year old living with her grandparents in Arkadelphia, Arkansas, she wasn't listed as Myrtle May on the census record. She was listed as Mutt, M-U-T-T. How do you name a little girl Mutt? I couldn't understand that. But what I 
do understand about my family. Some family members may have had a, a liking for a, a plug of tobacco or something, and they were chewing on it, and somebody asked them, what's their child's name? They said, Mert. And because of what was in their mouth, it might have gotten muddled, and somebody wrote down Mutt. They may have called her Mutt. I don't know, but I don't think so. I think Mutt was, Mert was probably the shorter part of Myrtle May, and somebody misinterpreted it and wrote it down as Mutt. But I found her and verified that it was her. And again, I, I would have never associated that name with her, but I, I found it. Yeah, good. Yeah. So um, thank you so much for doing this. This was great. Um, I wanted to tell everybody that Ancestry, as of right this moment, and we've turned the month, so this is July 1st, it is still accessible via home um, if you have a Cal's library card. This is something that Ancestry did because of the pandemic, because of the shutdowns um, or the, the stay at home orders, they have allowed libraries to give access at home, um, which normally you had to come into the branch to use. So as of, as of right now, uh, we've turned the month, we've kind of held our breath on the last day of every month to see if, if it was gonna go away. So I just double checked and it's up and I'm at home. So I'm not on some special library computer. But, and also uh, uh, Family Search. Uh, yes. Family Search is a free database. You do have to register. Uh, mm -hmm. It's from Salt Lake City, but uh, it's worth the uh, time and investment to go to Family Search. And they're adding new records all the time. So don't give up. Look for your number, uh, the names of your family members, and uh, don't expect them to be the person you knew when they were 80 years old. Look for them in their youth. Most of us did not have the same job our entire life. Most of us are not around the same people our entire life. So look for them in the situation they were living in at the time they were living there. For instance, my grandfather was born in Galloway, Arkansas, but most of his life was spent in Little Rock, Arkansas, which is uh, in the same county, but a little bit different area. Well, and, and if you see something on the internet, I mean, you know, don't Verify. believe everything you read on the internet. But, you know, if you go to Ancestry or Family Search or Heritage Quest and you find a family tree that somebody else has done and you think that that's your relative, but you're not really sure, go do the research on your own. You know, you may have a different view of, of you know, it may be your family, but they may have made a mistake or they may have missed, missed something that you can see. You can, you can go down that path too. Don't believe what, don't believe what you read. Also, another reason for writing it down is it can be corrected if you are wrong. Yes. So you can yes. be updated all the time. Uh, for instance, I forgot my grandfather was not the youngest son of Noxie. He was a middle son because he had a younger brother named Johnny, which I hadn't been able to find yet. But Johnny's a fairly common name also. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Rhonda, again for doing this. Thanks to everybody out there in cyberspace for joining us. Um, participants will receive a survey. You should see it as soon as I hit end of this webinar, if I did everything right on the front end, we'll see. Uh, but you should receive a survey, let us know what you thought about this, what, you've, what, you, um, what you'd like to see from other programs from us. And again, it'll be up on YouTube in the next couple of days. And now I wanna um, promo a couple of things we've got coming up. Next month's Legacies um, and Lunch will kick off the Cal celebration of the 50th anniversary of D. Brown's classic, Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee. Paul Domain, a Native American journalist and activist, will talk about his involvement in covering the activities of the American, the American Indian movement um, that was occurring at the same time that that Brown's book was published, and also some insights into his investigations into controversy, controversy stemming from that period. Um, it'll be here on Zoom and Facebook Live, if we can get Facebook Live to work again, um, which we did this month, so fingers crossed, and, um, and watch your social media feeds um, and your emails for links to sign up. It's not available for sign up quite yet. Also on Monday after the July 4th holiday, so that'd be July 6th, don't miss Cal's Encyclopedia of Arkansas's Monday Malady series. Um, the talk this Monday will be about Civil War soldiers and the 
the horrors that happened to them because of, you know, a war. Um, and so it's about, you know, it's about the gory details of war and go to encyclopediaofarkansas.net to see the details of that whole series. So thanks again, everybody. And um, we'll see you soon. Thanks, right. Rhonda. Document your family history. Okay, I'm going to end everything and I will see you in the library when I see you. All right. Thanks. Bye. Bye.